the McCombs tulip. What is the history of this strain? How does it grow, flower, and produce overall when grown in a small two by four indoor setup? What are the terps and effects? And do the T and B CO2 refillable packs actually work? All these questions and much more answered in today's Seed to Harvest brought to you by Homegrow TV. As always, this is strictly an educational documentary backed by science and research. I do not in any way promote the use of legal or illegal psychoactive substances. So please be responsible and thank you. All right, so now that we got that out of the way, let's talk a little summary of what we're going to be covering in today's Seed to Harvest episode of the McCombs Tulip. First off, as always, we're going to be diving into the strain's history. Like, why is it named McCombs Tulip? What is that? McCombs Tulip, the breeder history. Dutch Passion has got a lot of years in the game. We're going to talk about how this strain ended up on the channel. And we'll talk lightly about some of the other strains that we're going to be growing from this little Dutch passion, little test hunt. This was the first grow where we actually get to compare the old 200 watt S24 LED that I've used in a lot of the 2x4 grow videos to the brand new Evo 3 that steps up the wattage to about 270 watts in this 2x4 space. 2x4s is always going to be one of my favorite 10 sizes. I will never get old of testing in a 2x4. I think it's one of the most controlled little areas. I'm getting ahead of myself. One of the next things we'll be covering in the episode, which I've been dying to test for a long time, is if these little T and B CO2 refillable packs, the little shaking cans, you know, shake once a day, if they actually do anything. <laughs> And ultimately, if it's worth it. I've purchased these for a few grows in the past, and I've never had a way to actually monitor it or see if it's doing anything. This is what we're gonna be using to test and see if there's actually any changes in CO2 throughout our grow, because this sucker right here monitors CO2. For this entire grow, we're going to be using Kronk nutrients once again, just like we have been over the last few grows, pretty much this entire year. All the discounts for everything we use in this video will be down in the description below. It's also worth noting you're never going to see a discount link or an affiliate link or any of that stuff to something that we would not actually personally use ourselves or have approved in our books and actually genuinely believe in recommending. 100% of the links that are down there are down there because we like, trust them, and believe in them. So yeah, thank you to everyone who has been using those links and discount codes and let's jump into the episode. Let's jump into the breeder history and strain info, or cultivar info. This is the first of three strains that I'm going to be testing from Dutch Passion. I'm not going to lie, it was years ago when I was watching the Mr. Canuck videos that I just seen huge buds on all the autos that he was running time and time again. Now for the autoflower strains, I have three auto ultimates and two Cinderella Jacks from Dutch Passion. And Dutch Passion was already a brand and a breeder that I had seen many, many times on whether it was trips to Amsterdam or High Times magazines. I just knew the brand, I was familiar with them, but I never actually personally tried them myself. But the way I decided to choose the three strains was to do something personal that I've always really wanted to try. To take something, a recommendation from a grow bro or someone from the community. And then thirdly, I wanted to try like the most expensive thing or the craziest thing on their catalog. So, well, starting with that one, that was the kerosene crash. As soon as I seen the price point, I knew I had to try it at some point. So that episode's coming up. The one I chose for my personal option was the Amsterdam Amnesia. This is something that brings me right back to Amsterdam. It's something that is like the most Dutch coffee shop strain that I could think of is like a good haze, a good amnesia. And that was my personal choice. So that episode will be coming out later.
Then the last one, which is the one we're reviewing today, the recommendation from the Grow Bro, the community, or the people, is the McCombs Tulip. On their website, funny enough, even when you go down to see what cannabis cups that they've won in, it was actually second place prize at the Fada Jonas Medicinal Cannabis Cup in 2019. That was the Cannabis Cup a year, is it two years ago now? That we ended up taking third place in with our Lemon Orange. So after having a personal buddy recommend it, after it popping up a few times on Instagram and people asking about it or recommending if I had ever tried it, I decided this one was gonna be the people's choice, the McCombs Tulip. The terps on this strain are supposed to be really predominant on the Lylanol end, over 31%. Then we should be followed up by lemonine, beta caryophyllene humulene and then pinene. So those are the trace ones, humulenes and pinene, but caryophyllene and lemonene are both, you know, all three of these really are, are the predominant ones, which we've seen many times before, but I can't say we know a strain that is predominant or leading forward with Lylanol first. McCombs Tulip should have a sweet, fruity, and creamy character honoring the gelato genetics. McCombs Tulip is a typical gelato hybrid her aroma is pungent and best described as very sweet, creamy, and fruity. This aroma is a flavor explosion when it comes to a unique terpene profile that really makes the bud smell and taste like ice cream. I mean, gelato, 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 you see it so much, so often over the last few years, and there's probably good reason. A good gelato really does give you that, that ice cream. I know on my last travels to the US, oh, Buddy. What'd you get, bro? I cannot believe it. I got the lemon cherry gelato. First time I went to a dispensary ever in California. Oh my god, holy shit, you just opened that up, bro, and that smells is... Smells amazing, really? right? Holy Let's put it this way, there's a reason you see it pop up in quite a few crosses. And the way they got a hold of this is actually kind of interesting. The head of genetics for Dutch Passion came across this very special gelato phenotype on one of his travels. The plant had a special sweet scent and a beautiful blue tones. Blue tones. The glittering buds were rock hard, and the head of genetics was surprised by the rich flavor that matched the sweet, appealing aroma of the flowering plant. He immediately knew these genetics would form a good basis for yet another exceptional Dutch Passion cross. Wow. So McCombs Tulip is gelato crossed to sherbet. And after taking a deep dive through and really reading into it, it seems like they've really worked on creating the best gelato sherbet cross. Again, both of these strains being strains that you see in a lot of different crosses. And it's not always the first who did it, but it's who did it right. And these being US genetics, it's also about who is doing it right in seed form for those living in places in Europe that want to try amazing U.S. genetics like gelato, like sherbet, crossed together in a stable way that you know when you pop that you're going to get them gelato sherbet terps. That is what Dutch Passion set out to create here with the McCombs Tulip. I feel like there's good reason to be able to trust a brand like Dutch Passion since they're one of the world's oldest cannabis seed banks and one of the few remaining original seed companies. Yes, I started with uh, cannabis seeds in 1972. That was the time that uh, I, I put the first uh, seeds in the soil and they did well. Dutch Passion was created by Hank Van Dalen in 1987 and he had been searching through cannabis years and years before creating Dutch Passion. Hank and Dutch Passion are most famously known for introducing feminized cannabis seeds back in 1990s. Yeah, like bringing feminized seeds to the map. What we know today, what we take for granted, was done by these guys right here. The last thing I was really curious about is how did McCombs Tulip get its name? Like who's McCombs and like, is this his tulip? Like what's the deal here? And interestingly enough, when this gelato fino arrived in Macomb, which is an old name for Amsterdam, but it's almost like Amsterdam's tulip, right? Their prized flower is this gelato sherbet cross. So I'm hoping it's gonna be tasty. 
They say it should have an eight week flower time, XL harvest, and THC levels between 15 to 20%. So it's gonna be a fun, interesting test to see what Amsterdam or what Holland's version of the gelato sherbet is, what their take on gelato sherbet is. How we got these seeds was another amazing story and big shout out to the grow bro back from Barranquilla pulled through when he was at Spanibus and ended up hitting the Dutch Passion booth for us and picking up these three strains because we couldn't hit it this year. So if you don't follow this guy already, go follow him on Instagram, support the brother, tell him what's up. Thank you back. All right, now that we got everything covered from the cultivar info to the little bit of the breeder history, I mean, I really think we got to go more in depth on the Dutch passion history here later in a future episode or maybe even hopefully a podcast. But now it's time to pop these beans and start the seed to harvest. So as always, we use the cotton pad method to sprout these seeds. And now is probably the time and the place to say this, that this method of sprouting in a cotton pad that, you know, we've really just been hitting home over the last year and a half, two years, came from Dutch Passion. If you go to their website, you can actually see that they teach this exact method. That's where we learned it and that's where we learned to teach it in our teachings. So major shout out to you Dutch Passion for teaching us how to germinate seeds in this way. So 48 hours later, we got a nice little, about a one inch taproot, which is more than enough to plant her in her soil, which, which they're going into a homemade mix of cocoa and castings in their little one gallon dollar city pots. Just plop her in there and sprinkle a little bit of soil on top. Next, we threw in the little popsicle stick and sprayed them down, which I'll say this now, I will never do the popsicle stick again. Avoid it, just gets moldy later. So here we are 12 days later on what we're calling day 12 veg. If you know number one and two, both looking good and no major differences to point out other than potentially if you know number two is just a little bit slower to start. We'll see later if that makes any major differences in final flower. And here they are at the bottom of the veg tents quite far away from the light but when they're in the seedling phase they don't really need much and the way they're sitting that way at least they're not getting hit with direct wind but there is still a little bit of slight airflow which will start to kind of thicken up that stem so nine days later and wow what a difference this is day 21 veg and starting off in the tent here See, we got new clones in the background, but these two have just changed enormously. I brought them into the studio to see if we could see any differences starting off. Pheno number one definitely continued to lead and grow taller than Pheno number two. Pheno number two is already showing that she's shorter, stacking, closer internodal spacing. Whereas Pheno number one, it's not that she's stretching out, she's just growing more like a normal plant. So there wasn't much to do other than throw them back inside the veg tent and let them keep doing their thing, which, funny enough, they're sitting right in front of the Battle of the Blueberries. So seven days later, on day 28 veg, and we're back in the studio for the top. Things are looking good, green, healthy, and for the top on this one, I decided to come down quite a bit and really even out that canopy, taking off the bottom two growths and leaving just four total bud sites. The reason I wanted to go with the big top on this one partially was to delay their veg and just continuously train them out and train them out. So went for a bigger top than normal and trying to keep them as even height as possible all the way from seed to harvest. So one week later on day 35 is when I decided we were gonna transplant them and throw them into 10 gallon fabric pots. We're going big on this one. As soon as we took off the pots, I could see that they were already a little root bound. We've had some dry out problems here and there and it was definitely overdue. As always, we sprinkled down the power mix and the mycorrhiza. (laughs) 
And the roots on the other Fino, I mean, they were looking good. It was nothing, it's not like terrible, but it was definitely time to get out of there. A little bit of browning here and there. So now that we got them transplanted in, it was also the perfect time to start doing the plant training. With the AC Infinity garden wire, it's super easy because you just tear off a little piece, go to the side of the pots, and train down as much as you want to. And because we've been on our training already so far, it was pretty easy because there was only four tops to train down. So we split up the four tops and pull them down on each of the phenos. Oof, when you get them in the studio, you can just see how those are going to build out. So this is the part of Edge where things start to get nuts. Things had really exploded inside the tent once they settled into their new pots. Leaves everywhere, which is a great sign. Everything was looking happy and healthy, but it was time to get them into the studio for their lollipop and defoliation. So for this defoliation, we pretty much took off anything on the bottom third, not even the bottom half of the plant. Leaving the top canopy nice and intact and we'll be getting to those top fan leaves later. But our goal here was to clean out any of the bottom, increase the wind flow throughout the bottom, clean a lot of the middle as well, and leave all the little top bud sites intact and looking good. You can see once we get them back inside the tent, the bottom is looking nice, it's clean, the airflow is now moving through there and all the light is just concentrated on the top canopy. So, mission accomplished. So five days later, it was time to get back in the tents and maintain some of that training. Things were looking really good. But our pheno number one was still continuing to grow taller and taller than pheno number two and almost creating a big gap by now. So on our tall pheno, I decided to do some HST or high stress training. See, I simply do this by grabbing the tops and just twisting from side to side while lightly pinching at the same time. Kind of softening that whole wall of the stem and flopping it around in a 360. What this does is kind of slows down the growth of that main leading top site and kind of lets the other branches focus out and bush out. Another extreme way to do this would just be to cut it off and as you'll see later, we might need to do that. But for now, my hopes were to keep that whole main cola intact and well, potential cola and let that be the big stackers and in the meantime, HST it and hopefully she bushes out and lets the other pheno catch up. You can see even after training though, there's still quite a bit of height difference and we might need to look into either raising the short pheno or potentially even topping again on our tall pheno. This was also the day when the Pulse Pro showed up. So from this day forward, we could officially start monitoring on a constant basis the metrics in our garden. One of the most exciting reasons why I got this tool, well, there's a few reasons. There's things that I wasn't monitoring before like CO2 and what we're testing in this video. There's the PAR meter, the spectrum monitor. One of the cool things that I haven't had before and I had issues with in the past is light leaks. So this little sensor right here, as you can see on screen, we can tell exactly the amount of hours that things were on. So when this thing first got turned on and we used it, pretty much through the whole plant cycle was, was this right here. And we'll be diving more into these metrics in, in just a bit. But what I really liked about this, one of the biggest reasons why I dove into wanting to test it and have one of these in the garden was because of the light sensor. So because of light leaks in the past, I've had herm issues in other gardens. I've had things on in the tent when I didn't know they were on. And this right here would have alerted me in the past. As you can see, our light cycle is still in veg. And you can see when it goes into flower, we take off CO2. And it goes into 1212, and then the days get shorter basically, right? In this 1212, whereas here that they're long days. So the light sensor was one of the first reasons and one of the biggest reasons why I wanted to jump into having a Pulse Pro in the garden. This is also going to be the monitor that we're going to be looking at the CO2 and if this TMB actually plays a role at all, and we'll be looking at that later. 
but on setup day this thing was a breeze to set up you just simply plug it in get it hung in your garden and then to sync it up was really easy you search for it you connect it to your wi-fi so even if i'm out in california which was a real life situation i was there i could see all my metrics and in future episodes we'll be diving into the capabilities of the hub and actually monitoring my soil moisture and when it's time to feed and and ultimately is going to be my myth busting tool to see if tmb really does anything so once we got everything dialed in we set our times and our schedules and our alarms things were set and now we were officially tracking all the data inside of our garden which we'll be diving into later in the episode Another week goes by and it's day 67 of veg and officially our last day of veg. Today we were going to be conducting a little bit more training and swapping out our light to the brand new Evo 3. Things were looking lush in the garden. That short pheno was slowly starting to catch up and the amount of potential bud sites was just ridiculous in here. Because the height was still getting out of control, I decided to go in there and snip off a few of the tallest bud sites. Ultimately, just kind of evening out this canopy and hoping that I wasn't going to be making any detrimental changes to my final harvest weight. On the short pheno, I also just cleaned up a few of the top little fan leaves, opened up the canopy a little bit. And before we swapped out this light, that's where I wanted to conduct one of the other tests that I thought was really cool about the Pulse Pro. And that was do a spectrum test and a par reading on both our lights. On the S24 200 watt, which we've used many times before on the channel and produce some really fire flowers. I wanted to see exactly what we were getting on the spectrum as well as the par before we swapped it out to the brand new Evo 3 as we go into ultimately testing to see if this light is worth the upgrade. So doing a spectrum test was really easy. I just threw it on a tripod in the middle of the tent. And when I pulled it up on the website, what's really cool about this is these are always saved. So in theory, you could go in and do different spectrum tests and different par readings on many different levels and different heights in your tent with maybe even different LEDs. And you could have those saved in there and know, okay, when I'm a one foot away or a foot and a half away or two feet away at this, at this power level, you're always going to know exactly what the readings were at. So the first readings that we took here with the S24, but on our S24, this reading here, we took at 80% power at four feet away. So four feet away at 80% power, we got 290 PPFD, which is okay for veg. You know, it's a low, it's kind of on the low end. It's already good for early seedlings, like just after seedling into early, early veg. But once we lower the light to a foot and a half away, at 80% power still, not 100, we're getting 531, which is much better. So now that we had those readings logged in and saved, it was time to install the brand new Evo 3. This thing is slick. It's got three total bars and upgrades us from 200 watts to 270 watts of power inside this 2x4. We get extra coverages on the side, and overall, I feel like better light distribution from end to end. Once we had everything plugged in, we did the next spectrum test, and we decided to do a foot and a half away at 80% first, which was already an upgrade at 700 PPFD. Then when we turned it up to 100% and closed the tent, at a foot and a half, we were getting almost a thousand, which is pretty much max. You don't need to go higher than that. So already with just that simple test on the Pro, I could tell that there was much more power coming from this Evo 3 than I had before on the S24. And the buds I already got out of the S24 were ridiculous. So imagine what's gonna be coming with the Evo 3. We had the LED set to 60%, and we turn the timer to 1212, officially starting the flower phase. Oh, we're officially in the flower phase. I gotta roll one up. This is Kerosene Crash from Dutch Passion, and oh my god, this is Gorilla Glue crossed to Sherbert. Oh, gassy, woody, so strong. I think it's called crash for a reason, but 
eh, we're getting into the flour phase. So for the sake of science, I'm gonna twist up one of these kerosene crashes. Then we're gonna continue the into flour phase. Start the timer. All right, that should be more like it. How long was that? I don't know, it felt like under a minute. But let's get in the zone. Let's become one with the flour. That's more like it. Okay, where were we? The official start of flour. So this is three days later on day three of flour, week one. The very beginning of that stretch is already started, already, although it's kind of hard to note, but you can tell the plants are perking up and getting ready for something special. It was interesting to note too, I could almost start to see a more distinguishing difference now in the pheno's leaves, that the tall pheno on the left, pheno number one, almost had a thinner leaf structure on her new leaves compared to uh, pheno number two, but both looking good and exploding well. So day three flower was the perfect time to add in our split test, our myth busting for this episode, the T and B CO2 refillable packs. Do they do the job? Do they do the trick? Are they worth it? Cause I've been investing in them for a while for a few grows and I get the question all the time. And I didn't know how to legitimately answer it until we got to this video and to this test. So this was the day where we set it up and we wanted to make sure and follow all the rules. A Little bit of warm water inside of this sucker. Shook her up for a few minutes, and it was time to get her in the tent. Oh, also this thing is brand new. This is the new intake air filter that filters in the air that goes inside my tent, taking out all that pet hair or dust particles or who knows what else is getting in there. I wanted to start using these to see if I could get cleaner buds by the end of harvest. Once the TNB was in the corner, I decided to start off this test being in the bottom right next to the fan. And look, we're gonna be testing it all over the tent. I really wanna get to the bottom of, is this thing gonna increase the levels of CO2 in the tent? But my thought process was, it's right next to the intake, the air is coming in, there's a fan right there, and eventually it's getting pulled out. It's getting taken out, it's not a sealed room. So would that CO2 go up, knowing that CO2 is heavier than air? Well, that's what we wanted to test for the first two or three days. And we'll be checking in on the daily on the Pulse app. A few days later on day seven of flower, end of week one, and we're back inside the tent. Every single day we've been going in and shaking our TMB, and today we decided to actually move it above the plant canopy at the top left corner. I've been absolutely loving this new little Petra Tools hand wand sprayer. It's called the HD 5000. I'm not sure if we have an affiliate link for it, but we should, because I really like this thing. I don't know, check down below, we might already have one for it. I gotta ask them. So when I went into the dashboard to see, this was around this time here, if the CO2 was doing anything, I realized that our levels were already below average on what normal outside CO2 is, which is when I clued in that you're supposed to calibrate the CO2 on the Pulse Pro when you get it. Interestingly enough, you can see as soon as I did calibrate it right here, you can see the difference. And the calibration experience was actually super easy. All right, so we put our value 420 in. Okay, yeah, everything else, we're good. Let's go update. And now wait five minutes to 15 minutes on battery. Okay, so we're on battery. Hey Siri. So I actually had to repeat this and calibrate every single one of the Pulse Pros. And what was cool about this is we would be seeing 
this tent compared to the other tents that did not have TMB, was there actually gonna be a CO2 level difference in this tent? So it's pretty common knowledge that levels of CO2 air are typically range from 300 to 400 outside, but can get as high as 600 to 900 in the metropolitan areas. So knowing that we have that calibrated, put that inside, we're hoping that we're gonna at least be seeing higher levels than what we normally see in our tent on this CO2. The next day we came in with the can of fogger and hit them with some crop defender. Day 13 flower. Here's a short little update from inside the tent. Oh, I love this start. So this is, you know, we're getting that stretch on. We're getting the first little bud sites start to develop and the plants starting to show how they're going to eventually build out. You can see the pheno on the left, the tall pheno is really stretching and has a longer internodal spacing than the short pheno on the right. As well as she's a little bit of a lighter green, whereas the short pheno is kind of like a darker green. It's been important to note we've been following the Kronk Nutrients feed schedule from their website to a T on both plants and neither one is getting any differences. So it's interesting to kind of see the little differences happening already. There's our TMB CO2 being shaken on the daily and let's take our first little look and this would be May 22nd when we're in the tent. So every time when we go in we're shaking them those are probably those peaks. So is it actually any different from the other tents in that time period? So it was like 480 to 500. And if we go over to the tent that the blueberries were in at that time range, May 22nd. So no, it's about exactly the same as the other tent that didn't have CO2. Actually, you can even see some spikes that were bigger in a tent that didn't have the TNB CO2. So, so far after getting calibrated, after about the first week of testing the CO2 and shaking it on the daily, having the monitor in the middle of the tent and the TNB up on the top left, so far we have not seen an increase of CO2. Ooh, here we go. Day 21 flower, the end of week three. So when the buds are really starting to take shape now, and in theory, they should be finishing their stretch. That is strain dependent, and some strains will stretch a little bit longer than others or stretch throughout their entire flower cycle. As we can see, the one on the left, our taller pheno, has definitely established a height difference. With the boat almost a foot to a foot and a half height difference from both phenos, and even though she stretched up, she has a nice stack going on, and quite a few little buds stacking up. The pheno on the right looking a darker green and almost a little waxy on her leaves, meaning she's a lighter feeder, probably has maybe a little bit too much nitrogen going on. Whereas the pheno on the left almost looks like she needs more nutrients, like more magnesium, stems are green at least, but she was a little bit yellowing on, on almost some of those leaves. But either way, it was time to get the defoliation done. And this is something we like to do around that day 21 mark. After the plant has finished its stretched and moving into its bud development is when we like to leaf strip, create as minimal stress as possible on one single day and let them cycle into their flower fattening up mode. This is taking off most of the main stem fan leaves and this is what the plants look like after. I know they kind of look bare, but as you'll see later in flower, they're gonna fill out again. Shout out to the Grow Bro Brian, by the way, who does a lot of the handwork here on the daily here at Homegrow TV and is our first apprentice that we've had join the channel. He's hardworking, he's humble, and the dude loves the plants. He's got the passion. So follow him on Instagram if you guys don't already. I'll throw it up right here. Cultura Paisa 420. Much love, dog. So here we go to day 27 now, week four, for a little intent update. Now I'm starting to spread some of that frost. Trichomes are definitely there. The short pheno looking good so far. The tall pheno, wow. Like the 
how far these pistols shoot out, little golf balls already forming everywhere, and it's still only day 27. This was shaping up to be a big producer, and it doesn't even look like I topped the plant last time when we did. Like, where do we take the tops from? There's <laughs> just a bunch of main colas everywhere. So here we are for day 35, the end of week five flower. It's fair to say the short pheno has fattened up a little bit, but definitely frosted up, a lot more frost. But the tall pheno is now just, wow, thickening out majorly. getting a little bit of this deficiency in some of the leaves which I'm starting to feel like it was almost a magnesium deficiency or magnes kind of yellowing almost from the inside out but let me know what you guys think down in the comments below what this could be it also very well could be light stress as well being the height difference and this one being so close up to the canopy which I think I now had this LED set to about 70% So nine days later, day 44, week seven flower, and we're back in the tent where things are just thickening up. I remember sticking my head in at this point. I was already getting excited to show these to Mr. Q by Final Flower because, oh, they were right up his alley. I could already smell like the true gelato popping out. And I know he's a big fan of gelato. He loves that creamy gas all day, every day. And I was already getting it from the whole entire tent. We'll talk later in flower differences from Fino to Fino, if there was any at all. But so far, the buds were developing really nice. Oh yeah, so on average, most of the conditions, everything was looking good. But when we hop into just our CO2, this is what we've been getting throughout the past few weeks as we've been doing our checkups. The only major spike we had was here and here, and I assume those were both times when we shook in the bottle. Although, we were pretty on top of shaking the bottle every single day. And even then, those spikes here lasted from... They lasted like not even a half hour and it was back down to just normal. So if anything, I guess, yeah, the shake in the bottle works, but then the effects of it are gone within 15 to 20 minutes. And that is throughout this entire flower cycle so far with the TNB and we were, I can't remember what the recommended time was to swap these out, but I bought extra packs and everything like I always do. And I've famously said in videos before, just shaking it, hoping that this is actually making a difference. Well, I think what we're seeing here, it made no difference. Comparing it to the other tents as well, it got myth busted pretty quick. And after about a month of using it, after cycling through two different packs, I think it's fair to say so far we haven't seen a difference, but we'll sum up our conclusion and final thoughts later in this video. So seven days later on day 51, week eight flower, and we're back into the two by four for another update. Our short pheno on the right was now going deep, dark purple, almost like that famous blue that was written on the Dutch Passion website. Wow, could this be what we're seeing from the gelato side of things? Like it was just gorgeous, I love it. It's dark, dark purple, black, oh. And we look at the buds on our short pheno and things are really dense and up, frosty and just greasy guys it was turps were greasy and we'll talk about those more in a sec very notable turps i'll say that much on our tall pheno light green really thin leaves and noticeable visual difference from the other pheno the stack had turned into these beautiful buds now and every other bud had fattened out past golf ball size this thing was looking to be a really good producer All right, coming to the end of flower, and here is day 57, week nine. Short Fino has finally transformed into a real 
final flower plant. Like, just gorgeous, jaw-dropping. Wow. And looking back at these shots, seeing how much further away she was from the light, I'm surprised we got her as good as we did. Like, if she was closer to the LED, I think the difference would have been major. God, the stank on this, though, was really, really impressive. I knew this was going to be a crowd favorite. And funny enough, they both had the same terps, totally different visual plants. Although I will say the short pheno was much greasier and maybe was leading to a stronger aroma, but it was hard to tell in the tent. We'll take him out and look further, but it was getting to know a true gelato and not the fruity gelato, but the dessert, the creamy, I think it's the 41. I'm not sure. It's not specified on the Dutch Passion website, but I know there's definitely a fruity gelato. And then this gelato here, this is coming from that dessert gas. Like it's on point guys. So a good time to do a trichome check as well to see if we really were in final flower heading into that harvest. This little microscope too, by the way, I get the question a lot. You can find a three pack of them on Amazon. After scoping both out, I could tell that it was only a matter of days. I called it about three and they were gonna be coming down. That brings us to day 69, week 10, the end of flower and officially harvest day. Let's hop into the studio. As per usual, we had Grobro Mr. Q over to check out final flower and do some grading. Comparing flower stack, height, girth, and obviously terps. And I'd be lying if I said visual appeal doesn't have a slight impact as well. Starting with this Fino number one, this thing was sexy. It finished in probably my favorite shade of purple we've ever had when it comes to the fan leaves. Inside the bud itself still remained like a nice green, white because of the frost, but just turned out and fanned out into this ridiculous dark black purple. Lord, we couldn't close our eyes. Our tall Fino finished on the other end. It was thin leaf structure, flushed out nicely with nice yellow leaves, and stacked these ridiculously fat nuts. Like I said earlier, it was crazy on how on point both Terps were. When side by side, they were both truly this gelato sherbet combination. I don't know if visually we're seeing more sherbet on one and gelato on the other, but the Terps definitely had like the pungentness, like the this, this sting from the sherbet, but it had this creamy, probably more dominant side from the gelato. Ice cream, legitimately. I wonder if that's the combination of majority lilinol and karyophyllene being in there. As far as a producer, it was definitely fair to say that the tall Fino won majorly. It was also closer to the light, but just stacked big nugs all over the place. On the turp battle, I would say the short purple Fino wins, although they're both really, really close and both really tasty. We brought them under the Eleclev little microscope, which this is another amazing tool for under a hundred bucks. It records the video and everything. And we wanted to take both phenos under here to see if we were gonna find any anomalies or any major differences from pheno to pheno. And funny enough, even growing further away from the light, the little purple pheno was still a winner. It seemed like it had fatter trichome heads as well as more dense. All right, enough little microscopes. It's time to whip out the big cameras. So cue up the macro montage. You know, I don't even really know where to begin because it seems like every time I get ahead, I end up going two steps back. So tonight, I'm just gonna let this one fly. You know what I mean? 
Man, I just can't get enough of that macro world and just beautiful, astonishing flowers when you look at them under that type of lens. Beautiful. Before we cover the final harvest weight and my overall thoughts of the McCombs Tulip, I thought it was probably a good time to conclude the TMB little test that we did during this episode. Um, although I've purchased them in the past for grows that we did on our first Humboldt run and I've used them here and there on some of my like most exciting runs thinking that I'm giving them an extra little boost. Well, I can confidently say after this test that if you're running a system like mine in a tent that is filtering air in and out on a consistent basis, that this is not worth it. That it is not a good investment and officially I'm going to stop using them. I will say, however, that now knowing that this doesn't work and knowing the potential of what adding co2 to your grow actually can do in a sealed system i might be motivated guys in the next little bit to push things to the next level and set up a sealed co2 room with an actual tank a titan regulator you know actually do co2 monitoring it from seed to harvest when we have high levels of co2 throughout if anything i feel like this little experiment kind of pushed me to test more in the growing world and if anything this tool right here genuinely not only disproved this but kind of pushed me as a grower to learn more in general as we were doing this test about co2 i was researching about co2 i've been researching more about the diff in your garden from temperatures from day to night and the different effects that metrics can actually have on your garden when it comes to fine tuning things so i do have an affiliate link down below because i truly do like this tool and believe that it's a good asset to a lot of home growers for those who don't have ac infinity setups and you don't have even a controller 69 to tell your basic metrics when you're out of the house, well, something like this will let you know what your metrics are in your garden all the time from anywhere you are in the world or out of the house, no matter what. So for those type of gardeners, I think it's a good fit. Or for those who do have the AC system like myself, but want to monitor a few extra things that they don't have access to, such as, again, light leaks and the light being on when it shouldn't or leaving things on when they're not supposed to be, CO2 levels or spectrum and PAR readings. I find this thing to be a good little addition to the tools that I have in my garden and how I'm tracking and keeping my garden good. Save yourself a little discount if you guys decide to pick one of these up using the discount code HOMEGROWTV. And remember, We'll never ever offer a discount code or promote anything to something that we don't truly believe in or use ourselves. Hence why we had to run the test and it didn't pass it. We do not recommend TNB. But after using this thing for six months and a few of their other new tools, Pulse, we're definitely gonna be sticking with them for the long haul. All right, enough Pulse mumbo. Let's talk about the final weigh-in. So here they are after cure in the sea vaults. We got them trimmed and then cured up. This is almost a month cure. And the first jar is 38. Our big tub right here is 181 grams so far. So 181 grams. Oh yeah, and then I found this other little jar here, which was another 11 grams. 192 grams from a two by four tent of the McCombs Tulip. Two seeds in 10 gallons. Hey Siri. What's 192 grams in ounces? 6.7 ounces. Hey Siri, what's 6.7 ounces in pounds? Almost half a pound. Wow, so 6.7 ounces, almost half a pound off a two by four with just two beans of the McCombs Tulip. Turpiful, flavorful, my God. The reviews at the Cannabis Cup were really high and there was a reason it placed second. So what are my overall thoughts of the McCombs Tulip? Is it something that I keep in my mother room and is it something that I recommend? I think overall it was a really good experience for those people who want to know Gelato and the Sherbert. It truly was true to the terps, true to the nose, and although we've seen visual differences in our two Finos, somehow the terps really matched up on both of them and the short one's a little bit stronger, but when combined in the jar, you couldn't really even tell the difference on weigh-in. Creamy, gassy, stanky, wow. McCombs Tulip is definitely, definitely approved in my books. I did not keep a mother clone, but 
I got like six to seven questions about if I had a clone of it when I was at the cup and since then. So it's a sign that she definitely was a winner, but I'm a fruity guy. I love exotic, delicious fruits. Although I love to have amazing stuff like this and good gelato crosses or just creamy gas in my jars every now and then. So I'm really glad I grew it out. And for anyone looking for a good experience of something that they know is a gelato in a world where there's like, feels like thousands of different gelato and sherbet crosses, this was a really well done job from Dutch Passion on the side of creating something that is true to that experience. If you go to a dispensary, or I don't know if the coffee shops in Amsterdam have gelatos or good gelatos, but in the US for the most part, you get a good gelato and the difference is, is unreal. And there's a reason why it's so famous. So I think they did a great job on creating a true representation of a good gelato, Sherbert Cross. And for those looking to try something like that, maybe it's a good fit. But I'm gonna continue on my fruity hunt. And I do have a special place in my heart for sativas and hazes, which is one of the strains that we're gonna be testing up next, the Amsterdam Amnesia. So make sure you guys stay tuned for the next seed to harvest on that. Producing over six and a half ounces in the two by four, I think speaks a lot as well to the gear and the setup that we use in this video. I am solely using AC Infinity on all of our grow gear and for good reason. I truly feel like they're the best fit for new growers and they have a good mix between really high quality gear for a fair price. It's not the most expensive and it's definitely not the cheapest, but the quality is really there. The full advanced grow kits are often my go-to recommendation for new growers or when I get a question of what to get. I mean, what else can I say? The 2x4 fucking rocks. It's dope. It's great for new growers or pro growers who want a little separate side space to test a little 2-3 plants every now and then. So we've covered pretty much everything in this video. If we've left anything to question, let me know down in the comments below. Thank you guys so much for sticking to the end of this video. Make sure you're subscribed, drop a like, and we'll see you next week on Homegrow TV.